I am now going to introduce Alka Joshi. Alka Joshi was born in India and moved with her family to the United States in 1967. Her given name at birth was Neelam, blue in Hindi, the color of her eyes. When she was six, her father, without explanation, announced that he had chosen new names for his three children. Neelam vanished. Alka took her place. Several years ago, Alka's mother remembered this story. Alka had no conscious memory of Neelam, but a vanished girl presents a mystery, and Alka has always liked mysteries. Neelam led her to an orphan village girl and to her older sister in a far-off city. Those two sisters led her to her novel, Henna, which imagines women living, serving, and surviving in post-independence India in 1955. As one of Alka's characters, a talking Alexandrine parakeet is fond of saying, Namaste, welcome, bonjour. <laughs> Alka Joshi, everyone. The novel that I've been working on for the past two years, Henna, is the life I imagined for my mother had she not had the constraints of a cultural norm that believes in arranged marriages and motherhood as the only career option for a woman. So when I write about Lakshmi, I think of my mother. I think of what she would have been like in 1955 in the state of Rajasthan. And lucky for me, she fought hard to ensure that my path would always be my own. Thank you, Mom. <clears throat> I came to CCA for several reasons. One is Anita Amirazvani, who has been an incredible, incredible mentor. Another is Amy Fan, who wrote a book that really inspired me. Another is Tom Barbash. Everybody said, I have to take a class with Tom Barbash. And I did, and I learned a lot. Um, I'd also like to thank Matt Sillady, who's going to help me with my graphic novel when I get that written. And Teresa Walsh, who does so many things for us in our um, program that we never see. It's all the behind the scenes stuff. Thank you. And I'm lucky in my choice of husband, Brad Owens, who wrote my intro. And he is a writer whose stories leave me breathless. Now, we are in Northwest India, in the state of Rajasthan. The year is 1955, eight years after India's independence from British economic and political rule. I feel her eyes on me as I pull the reed around a particularly tricky area of the little toe. I can't look up or the reed may slip and the henna will stray from the pattern, making my work for the past hour, undoing my work for the past hour. She leans toward me to examine her feet until our heads are almost touching. Her breath is sweet with the scent of betel nut. With your blue eyes and fair skin, Lakshmi, I should be nervous having you in my house. Now I look up and smile, holding the slim reed aloft and gently pushing her shoulder into the marigold cushions of the divan. You know I pose no threat, G. Compared to your pedigree, I'm a mongrel. My coloring could be the result of Alexander the Great helping himself to a Hindu maiden. Her smile is uncertain. Who knows, I say. I too may have warrior blood running through my veins. Parvati laughs, a lusty roar that shakes the divan. Shabash, she says, 
as if I've just played a trump card. She and her husband are of the Rajput caste that, for centuries, was entrusted with safeguarding princely estates, a duty that Parvati's late father, a Raja and close advisor of the Maharaja of Jaisalmer, performed for 40 years. To suggest that I might have sprung from such noble stock seems to her worthy of a disparaging snort. I wait, my hand hovering patiently over her foot until her ample form has stopped moving and she has finished wiping her eyes with the end of her sari. She's a handsome woman with dark eyes and full lips. Her jewel-colored saris, like the fuchsia silk she's wearing today, brighten her complexion. I dip the reed in the henna paste and start a new line along the arch of her foot. It's a sensitive spot on most women, and I feel her flinch. But she's a good customer and used to my ministrations. She manages not to shake the reed. My goal, as always, I say, is to make your husband, is to make sure your husband only has eyes for you, especially on the days after henna. Henna? This prompts another laugh from her. I don't know what you put in your henna, but it is true, Samir can't seem to stay away from my bed. And tonight will be no different, I assure her, as I finish my work. She persists. You know, that flower looks exactly like the one I've seen in England. You're sure you've never been outside of India? My breath catches, and for an instant, the old fear returns. But long practice has trained me to keep my eyes soft and my voice calm. If only I had such grand secrets to hold, G. Unlike my competitors, women from the Shudra caste, who paint crude designs with thick strokes, I mix a fine and silky henna paste in order to draw images as intricate as spider webs. My ladies need sit still for only half the usual time to allow the rich cinnamon imprint to dry on their skin. Low-caste women count on frequent applications of henna to bolster their meager income, but I rub a lemon and sugar mixture on the skin before laying the paste, ensuring that my work lasts up to two weeks. I also take care to lace my henna with neem and geranium oils to soften the skin. My wealthy ladies do no rough work, but Japur's desert climate can toughen even their hands and feet. When I first started serving my ladies, I soon learned there was more to be gained from attention to detail and exquisite design than from rote application, indistinguishable from that of second-rate providers. I could name a price five times higher than other henna artists and receive it. Under Parvati's feet, I placed a thick cotton towel so the henna won't soil the raw silk of the divan. Next to her feet are several toe rings and two golden anklets, which I will replace after completing the work. Once I've decorated her feet, it's time to remove the paste drawing on her hands. I reach for my steel tiffin. Draping a wet cloth over the remaining paste, I place the clay pot in one of the canisters. From a bottle, I pour a few drops of clove oil on my hands and rub my palms together to warm them. The massage will relax Parvati sufficiently to ensure she wakes up refreshed from her nap when Samir reaches for her. As the dried henna flakes off, she comments on my handiwork, pleased with the swirls of long life and third eyes for safety on her palms. When I told Parvati that I'd never traveled as far east as Morocco or as far north as Iran, I spoke the truth, but the courtesans who taught me their henna techniques came from lands even farther west and south. Now that her hands are glistening with a light sheen, the clove oil perfuming the air, I reach into another tiffin for a numkeen I had cooked earlier. Parvati craves these salty snacks, easy to disguise with parsley and garlic. She credits her second son to my consistent applications of henna, never suspecting that her husband's insatiable desire is a result of what I feed her. Calling to a servant to bring tea, Parvati reclines at one end of the rosewood divan while I sit perfectly straight on the other. I've trained myself to sit like this for hours with no back support. None is ever offered. 
Like all my ladies, she treats our time together as confessional. I am Brahman, she is Rajput. For thousands of years, these two castes have worked well together. Her ancestors employed mine to bless their religious rites and school their children. I am from a higher, in fact, the highest caste, but I lack the husband and wealth that would permit Parvati to treat me as an equal. Like all my ladies, Parvati assumes my husband abandoned me, an assumption I've taken no trouble to contradict. I still wear the vermilion bindi on my forehead that tells the world I'm married. That places me in the category of a working woman whose discretion can be trusted. If I had a loose tongue, I wouldn't be allowed into bedrooms like this one, quite unlike my own, where my feet rest on marble, an onyx pink mined here in Rajasthan Salumbar district. It's cool polish providing relief from the heat and dust outside. Eight years ago, before independence, most Japur families lived in the old city, in cramped family compounds, but Parvati and Samir Singh are part of the new set, modern India's best. They live just outside the pink city walls where the boulevards are wide and where stately colonials, once inhabited by Britishers, are concealed behind eight-foot walls, gleaming with glass shards. A servant girl arranges a cup of steaming chai on a table next to Parvati and another on the thali next to me. There will be a guest for lunch. Make sure we have fresh raita, she says. The girl widens her eyes, but there's no yogurt. Why not? The girl shifts her weight from one leg to the other, glancing at me. I lower my eyes, fingering my teacup. I too am at the mercy of her mistress's whims. Pretending not to notice the girl's distress is the only comfort I can offer. Cook didn't make any yesterday, she replies in a thin voice. Parvati's words are glass, clear and sharp. Then you and Cook must figure out how to get fresh raita on the table. The girl's lower lip quivers as she registers her mistress's displeasure. Let me know you understood me. The girl bobs her head and Parvati continues her instructions for preparation of the lunch. I turn my attention to the puja for Lord Ganesh that Parvati has set up on a table beside the four-poster bed. Two garlands, one of gardenia and one of tulsi leaves, drape the brass statue. A silver bowl holds two sweet ladus and an earthenware lamp, its wick dwindling, sits in front of Ganesh. Parvati would have lighted the dia for her morning prayers shortly after rising. The orange prayer bindi remains on her forehead. I too used to fast every Tuesday to honor my namesake, the goddess Lakshmi, back when my mother would recite to me the story of the poor Brahmin farmer who offered his only possession, a scythe, to the goddess Devi. The goddess was so touched that she presented the farmer a magic basket that would produce fruit any time he desired. But that was only a story, as true as all the others my mother told. And when I turned 17, I turned my back on the gods as I turn away from Ganesha's shrine now. On Samir's side of the bed are three Tulsi plants in porcelain pots, each pot decorated with scenes of English tea parties, women in corseted gowns, men in pantaloons, yellow-haired girls in frocks. Before independence, such objects were meant to signify allegiance to the British. Now, eight years after the departure of our occupiers, these are spoils of war, hard-won triumphs. When the British left, my ladies changed their reasons only. If I've learned anything from them, it's, it is this. Only a fool lives in water and remains an enemy of the crocodile. I rise and walk to the glass doors leading to the back veranda. In the summer months, the doors are left open and a mat woven from wet rear grass is draped across each doorway. An old family servant, now deaf, squats outside, periodically sprinkling the mats with water. When a breeze comes through, the mat releases a refreshing perfume, keeping the room cool and fragrant. Now, however, the doors are shut tight against the November chill, and I can see the vast backyard, a close-cropped lawn bordered by mango and people trees where three gardeners, swathed in mufflers, are watering, trimming, and weeding. 
Red hibiscus shrubs and sweet honeysuckle vines blanket the high stone walls. Parvati's older son, Ravi, is setting up a croquet game while his younger brother, Govind, slices the air with a mallet. One of Ravi's curls falls across his forehead. His square chin and jaw are his father's, shadowed in the area where he's recently started shaving. But he's inherited Parvati's rosy complexion, making him almost pretty. When the servant girl leaves, I say, Ravi has grown into a handsome young man. Behind me, Parvati murmurs, I'm glad you think so. To a woman in her circle, she might have countered politely, no more than your son. You must be looking for a good match for him, Henna. Oh, he's only 17. I lost him to Mayo College at 12. I'll lose him to England in another year when he goes to university. I can't bear to think of losing him to a wife just yet. I cross the room to the divan. Perhaps you're right. I sit down and pick up my teacup. Maybe the Dutts were in too much of a hurry with Bimal. Meaning? They just arranged marriage for him with the Kumar girl. I turn my head to watch her sons on the lawn and let out a sigh. The good ones are going like hot jalebis. Parents worry that once their son is off to England or America, he'll come home with a Western wife who speaks no Hindi. I note Parvati's furrowed brow and make a show of blowing on my tea. So much better to have everything settled before he goes off, henna? The Chandra girl was recently promised to the Prasad boy. They'll marry in three years. Wasn't he one of Ravi's classmates? I take a sip of my tea, glancing at Parvati. Her back has stiffened, and she's sitting straighter on the divan, looking out the window at her boys. Yes, as a matter of fact, he was. Slowly, like a baby bird, she leans toward me, which is a sign for me to feed her a snack. I oblige. Only then does she set her teacup delicately on the table. She wipes her mouth with a napkin. If I were interested in a match, and I haven't yet decided I am, have you run across anyone appropriate? I smile. I run across many eligible girls, but Ravi is not just any boy. I'll stop there. I want to thank you very much for being here. Under your chairs is a stick of sandalwood incense, which you are welcome to take as a remembrance. <laughs>